It was approximately 3.20 as the newspapers reported on the morning of March 13, 1964. A young lady, 28 uh, year old Miss Kitty Genovese, was returning to her home in a very nice middle, -aged, uh, middle class area of Queens in New York. She parked her car in a nearby parking lot, turned off the lights, and started to walk to her apartment building, which was only about 15 meters away. She got as far as the street light when a man grabbed her. She screamed, and lights in that 10-floor apartment building went up, went on. She yelled, oh my God, he stabbed me. Please help me. Windows opened in the apartment building, the man's voice shouted, leave the girl alone. The attacker looked up and walked off down the road. And this kitty struggled to get to her feet. Lights went uh, off again. And uh, the attacker came back and stabbed her a couple more times. She again cried out, I'm dying, I'm dying. And again the lights came on and the windows opened and many in the apartment building uh, made noises. The assailant again left, got into his car and drove away. The young lady staggered to her feet as a city bus drove past her at about 3.35 in the morning. But the attacker drove back again and he found her at her uh, doorway at the foot of the staircase and for the third time repeatedly stabbed her all over, this time with fatal consequences. It was 3.50 when the police received the first call. They responded quickly within two minutes, and when they, they were there at the scene, but the young lady was already dead, reported the New York Times. Kitty Genovese was a name that would become symbolic in the public mind for a dark side of the national character of the country. It would stand for Americans who were too indifferent, too frightened, too alienated or too self-absorbed to get involved in helping a fellow young woman being in dire trouble. Detectives investigating the murder discovered that no fewer than 38 of her neighbors witnessed at least one of her killer's three attacks, but none of them came to her rescue. Only one phone call was made to the police, but that was made after she was already dead. Some of you here this morning no doubt have heard the story. The incident may be the defining moment of urban apathy in the latter half of the 20th century. When it happened, many thought that the incident was shocking, bizarre, but not typical of the way people respond. The question was asked, what was wrong with these people anyway? Why didn't they react in a way human beings ought to react when somebody is in trouble? Today's scripture is the first century equivalent. It is found in Luke chapter 10 and beginning in verse 25. It is the familiar story of the Good Samaritan. And it is told, folks, in response to a question asked of Jesus by a Jewish lawyer. The story begins in verse 25 where we read, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? We are told that this man is a lawyer, but he's a kind of lawyer who goes to court in civil or criminal cases. This lawyer is an expert, however, in Old Testament law,
and he is the Old Testament scholar of repute. The question asked of Jesus by the boy is, what do I have to do to have eternal life? Basically, folks, he's asking, what must I do to be saved? When he asked Jesus this question about eternal life, he was asking what Jesus saw as the essential requirements of the law. Much like the rich young ruler in the book of Matthew, he seems to be saying, what good thing must I do in order to have eternal life? How do I gain this? I can just see Jesus smiling as he throws the question back in the lawyer's lap. In verse 26 he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? You understand that lawyers always consult other books, previous cases. So Jesus knew all about this and he was trying to show him, Hey, do your homework. Haven't you done your homework? What is your reading of it? Jesus restrains from giving the man an answer, rather saying to him, you know the law. What does it say? In verse 27, the lawyer answers Jesus, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will love. Jesus asks the question. The man gives the answer. And then Jesus responds by saying, Good answer. Now do it. Some are troubled by this answer. But we need to understand that Jesus is not saying he could be saved by the law. He is really reminding the man what the law says. That the law requires not only that one keeps the law, but that he keeps it perfectly. The law must be kept without omissions or failures. And so therefore to be justified under the law, one must be perfect. Jesus wants the lawyer to see the law cannot save anyone because no one can keep the law perfectly. Now the Old Testament lawyer did what lawyers do so well. He looked for a loophole in the law. And I guess it's not really lawyers that do this. Everybody that does this. We're always looking for a loophole where we can get out somehow. And so we see in verse 29, it says, But he, wanting to justify himself, don't we all try to do that? Justify means to make right, to make straight. So, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Here's the bright-eyed lawyer who knows the law, and he's asking Jesus now, who is his neighbor? Why did the lawyer ask this question? Luke says, because he wanted to justify himself, and therefore he wanted to know what is his what is the right relationship with God? That's what he was really getting at. The lawyer measured himself against both commands and he figured out that he met the first one well enough. Loving God with all his heart. He did it all, you know. And so he, he thought, you know, like, like a smug fella, I did it all. But he's keeping off the second one depended on how you define neighbor. If we get that definition right, then, you know, I'm right all round, he thought. Who and how much do I have to
to love. Who and how much do I have to love? Good questions. Because we like to love, but we have limitations. And there are certain people that we will love a lot, others just a little, and others we'll keep away from. We are often like the lawyer, in that we try to reduce God's commands to something we can live with. We would like to believe that loving our neighbor means loving people who really love us. Or at least loving people who are lovable. Loving my neighbor thereby comes to mean doing nice things for people who probably do nice things back for me. That is probably what the lawyer really thought. I guess we all like to believe that as well. The lawyer's original question was, what do I have to do to get in? But Jesus' answer is to tell him what someone who's already in looks like. Like many of us, the lawyer knew the right answer. But he was totally unprepared for Jesus' story about, the, about what compassion looks like in real life. Jesus then defines neighbor with a story. I mean, if you wanted a definition of neighbor, uh, you can go to the dictionary and get it. It'll be easy. But Jesus goes to great lengths to give him a story to define neighbor. Notice that Jesus did not call the story a parable. That's very important. Jesus did not call the story a parable. So it could be the report of an actual occurrence, not unlike, or very much like, the story that we just heard. Kitty Genevieve. The journey from Jerusalem Jericho to Jerusalem was well known for its dangers. It was very steep and treacherous because of many places where robbers could be hiding. In fact, it was so bad that the name of the road was the Way of Blood. So this was a very believable story to those who were listening. Let me point out that this story teaches us some basic lessons concerning compassion. Firstly, compassion is based on need, not worth. Can I repeat that to you because you didn't get it? Compassion is based on need, not worth. Not the worth of a person. Compassion is based on need. In verse 30 we read, Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And so our compassion is to be driven, not by the worth of the recipient, but by the need. Jesus just says a certain man. He doesn't tell us who this man is. He doesn't tell us about his certain portfolio and his titles. Today we would probably just say some guy. The man is robbed and wounded and left for dead. He needs help in the worst way. As the unknown victim lay by the safe side of the road, a series of three individuals come along the way. The first pass to buy is introduced in verse 31. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. 
a priest came down the road, but when he saw him, he crossed to the other side and continued his journey. The priest has been excused by most people through the years by saying he didn't want to touch someone that uh, might have been dead already. And then he would be ceremoniously unclean to do the work that he was called to do. You understand that priests have to be absolutely clean and pure and they cannot touch a dead body. And so some commentators went to some great extent to say, well, we can excuse the priest because he was on his way to get some work done and he couldn't touch a dead body. But I want you to notice, it says that both he and the Levite came along next are coming down the road. Do you see that in your Bibles? In other words, if we know a little bit of geography and know a little bit of the Holy Land, we will know that they were leaving Jerusalem and had already performed their duties. They were not going to do their duties. They had accomplished it already. This is one of the most shocking aspects of this parable or story when Jesus told it. The priest was considered the most holy person among the Jews. He was taught the scriptures. He was entrusted with offering the sacrifice for the sin of the people. He was allowed to go further into the temple than other people would go. If anybody was going to reflect the character of God, it would have to be the priest and nobody else. He was the closest to God. Nobody was permitted to go anywhere closer than the priest. Yet, he didn't have the heart of Christ. So many are involved in God's work, but they don't have God's heart. You can't do God's work without God's heart. The second passerby is introduced in verse 32. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place and came and looked and passed by on the other side, same thing he does. The Levite at least went over and he looked at the man. But perhaps he was no more than the current practice of rubbernecking at the scene of an accident to see what had happened like most of us do. Everybody just stops because we don't stop to help. We all stop because we want to see what happened. He too did not feel a need to do anything to help. Like Kitty Genevieve's neighbors, the first two passerbys probably just didn't want to get involved. They didn't want any trouble. They weren't monsters. They were regular people, regular folks, nice ordinary people who love their kids and try their best to get by in the world. Just like the witnesses in Kitty's murder. They saw the need but did not do anything about it. They were all good people. Both, both of these men saw the man saw the need, but ignored the need. These two religious professionals were caught up in lifeless religion. 